Good morning, Bethel. Uh, welcome once again to our Sunday School class. Uh, Sunday School study guide is study guide number 10. It is May the 9th. And the title of our Sunday School lesson is Isaiah, Offering Hope for the Future. Our Bible background is Isaiah 29. Our printed text is Isaiah 29, 13 through 24. Our devotional reading is Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. A common uh, verse of scripture. I aim for change. By the end of this lesson, we will consider how God's promise of mercy will triumph over God's judgment. Believe that an essential characteristic of God's nature is forgiveness and rejoice in the manifestation of God's love in our lives. And with just that uh, uh, aim for change, I can close the book right now because, you know, uh, we have to consider how God's promise of mercy will triumph over God's judgment. That's what we need. And believe that an essential characteristic of God's nature is forgiveness and rejoice in the manifestation of God's love in our own lives. Man, this is good already. Let us pray. Father God, we just come right now giving you praise, giving you honor, giving you glory, God, thanking you for this day, a day that we've never seen before, God. We thank you, Father God, for raising us up this morning and, and starting us on our way, God. Hallelujah. Woke up this morning and saw the bright sunshine, and I knew everything was going to be all right. God, I just thank you, and I love you, and I praise you, God. Continue to bless the listeners of this Sunday School lesson. Continue to bless Bethel Baptist Church as a whole. Now, Father, as we go through this lesson, go with us, teach us, give us the things that we need in this lesson to continue to trust you and love you and praise you with our whole heart. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Um, our in focus. Our in focus, Pamela was in a bind and needed help with an unexpected car repair. So she called in a favor from her friend, Aisha, who was always willing to lend a helping hand. What Pamela didn't know was that Aisha was fed up with being her emergency fund and already determined the next time she made one of her 911 calls for financial help, she was not going to help. The reason Pamela was not a good steward over her finances and was known for making poor choices. Aisha loved her friend, but for her well-being and for the sake of their friendship, she had to set that boundary. Also, Pamela was slow to return what she borrowed. Don't we know those? And when she did, there was always an excuse for not repaying the full amount. She called Aisha and asked for a $500 loan and said, I promise I will pay you back the next week, pay you back next week when I get paid. I will set it up to send electronically. I had to underline that because even uh, uh, Aisha knew that she was running out. Aisha thought, correction, Pam, Aisha thought, my father in heaven is rich, but I am not your bank. But instead, she responded, girl, I don't have the full amount, but I will give you half. I am so sorry. That's all I can do right now. I understand, Pamela said. I have been in your well. I've been in your well too many times. I need to make changes. If someone was a repeat offender, would you continue to give your resources uh, to help them? And, you know, I think we all have that problem sometimes, not necessarily that um, um, uh, a person is coming to us for money, but that same person is always in need, always in need, and we make up our minds that we're not going to do anything else. But as soon as they come, uh, I think the love of God has us to relent, and we try again to help that person. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Now, keep in mind, they also that erred in spirit shall come to understand, and they that murmured shall learn Doctrine. That's Isaiah 29 and 24. Uh, Matthew 7, 9 and 11 says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? 
Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a, a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Um, you know, we, we, we continue to go to the Father just like this for, for what we need from God. And, and even in this story where the lady was still able to give uh, this woman a good gift, we have to think about how good God is to us, just like it said in that scripture. And the Bible says to ask uh, and we shall receive and, and seek and we shall find knock and the door uh, shall be open. And just for an acronym there, the, a, the ask, seek, and knock, the A-S-K, if you think about it, that simple uh, 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 acronym for those three words is simply to ask. So we go to God and we just ask God. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. So we can just go to the Father and just ask him uh, uh, for the things that we need, the desires of our heart, and God will give us those things. We have a, a um, unifying principle. That unifying principle is relationships suffer when humans lapse into immorality. What is the result when we or others have been immoral? Isaiah prophesied that God would punish the people of Judah but still be merciful and restore uh, the nation. And that's pretty much what this uh, lesson is about today. So for, well, I'm going to go ahead and read this. But it says, uh, the focal verses, Isaiah 29, 13. Wherefore, the Lord said, for as much as the people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear, Toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? Is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to naught, and the scorner is consumed, and all that watch for iniquity are cut off that made a man offender that make a man an offender for the word and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate and turn aside the just for a thing of naught therefore thus saith the Lord who redeemeth Abraham concerning the house of Jacob Jacob shall not shall not now be ashamed neither shall his face now wax pale but when he when he seeketh his children and work of my hands the work of my hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. And I know that that was a lot to read and understand, but we're going to go through it and see if we can break it down um, and try to understand. Uh, people, places, and things. Isaiah was one of the greatest prophets of his time. Isaiah had a vision of God and was called by God to do God's work, bringing his nation to repentance, to save it from a whirlpool of destruction. His very name means Yahweh, the source of salvation. And that's a good thing, you know, because I've said so many times before that this plan of salvation is all God's plan. It has nothing to do with us. Uh, it's all God's plan where Adam and Eve has failed, and God set up a plan to come back and redeem us uh, for himself. Uh, the, the background. For 60 years, Isaiah served as a prophet in Judah. He stood as the voice of God amid the people, people's disobedience, and, in his, and his message was to call, back, call them back to God. At the start of Isaiah's divine appointment, 
Judah experienced military and financial strength. As a result, the elite disregarded God's commands, especially in their treatment of the poor widows and orphans, as well as their arrogance. And I would say, isn't it just like us as a people um, that we cry out to God and God provides for us? You know, we cry out for the material things. We cry out for the houses. We cry out for the nice cars and the, the proper clothes and the food um, that we eat and finances in our pocket. Only uh, the, to when we get it, we dis obey God's commands. We're no longer coming to church. We're no longer reading and studying our Bibles. We're no longer um, uh, pressed to where we uh, are in God's presence, to where we want to pray and bless the name of God because everything is going well. And when everything is going well, we feel like we're on the top of the hill. We feel like we don't need God after his blessings that has put us in those positions. And our God is a good God, and we turn our backs on him. Um, the neighboring Assyria grew in political and military power. Rather than turn to God of their salvation for refuge, Judah's judgment le ju government leaders looked to surrounding nations for safety, which was an insult to God. We ask God for help from others sometimes before we ask God himself. Uh, I can't pay my light bill. Can you can can you loan me a couple hundred dollars? Um, can you give me a ride here or there? Or uh, can I borrow this? I'm, I'll I'll pay you back. I don't have this in my refrigerator. Can you can you help me? Um, so we go to a temporary source instead of going to what is eternal, which is our God. And I say, imagine husbands anyway. Um, that you provide for your family, you provide for your wife, even wives that cook for their husband and so forth and make sure he's got everything he needs. And that spouse, that wife goes to another man and say, can you help me with this or that? And I'm sure that would be make a man furious. And I know for the most part, a woman is not going to stand for her husband to go to some other woman asking for help that she can provide. Or, 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 or let's just say she done bought him all kind of clothes and now he all clean and, and all whipped up. And, and, and now some other woman is saying how cute he looks and he gets stupid. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that's not going to last very long. The wife is going to be furious and somebody going to be sleeping on the couch <laughs> for real. Uh, Isaiah 29 opens with the prophet making a sorrowful declaration unto Jerusalem using the alias Ariel, which means Lion of God. Uh, Isaiah predicted how God would deal with Jerusalem's disobedience. The holy city would be under siege and the mourning because of the coming of distress at the hand of their enemies as punishment for their idolatry and self-centeredness. But the message also shifts focus that after enduring punishment, he would also handle those enemies who would rise against his chosen people. Have you experienced, have you experienced times where you thought God's help uh, wasn't needed? You know, we could choose uh, to walk away from God. And because uh, he will not force himself on us, he would let you have your way if that's what you decide that you want to do. But I believe that if, if, if you were truly belonging to God, that you will come back to God because the world does not have uh, that joy. You know, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And once you get that taste, then nothing else is going to fit. Nothing else is going to compare to the love uh, that God has. You know, um, I heard a preacher say one time that a, that a hog, you let a hog go, he go out there, he go, once you clean him up, he'll go back and get in the mud and waddle and get it all on his head and feet and get it everywhere and be happy that he's in that mud. But a sheep or, or, or a person that belongs to God, once he get in that mud, eh, he don't like that. He's going he's gonna to cry out to God, rescue me with that bad, bad, you know, help me, get me out uh, of this mess. But I also believe that once we leave God, that there is going to be a price to pay. 
there are consequences that we have to pay. And uh, these people in, in these situations, once, once they uh, left God and, and, and God allowed uh, Assyria, the country, come in and attack them and take them into captivity, they were in captivity for 70 years. This time, because <laughs> one time it was 400 years. Um, but for 70 years, uh, they got put out of their land. They got, they got took captive. Uh, they were prisoners of another country. However, God had a plan to deliver them uh, out of that situation with the same people um, that had, had, had given them captive. Uh, and I read in that scripture, um, uh, Isaiah, correction, Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14, you know what God says, I know the plan that I have for you. It's a plan of good, it's a plan of uh, not evil, um, a, a plan to, to give you great success. You know, we like to read that part, but all of that had to do, those scriptures, had to do with uh, Israel being in captivity uh, and, and God's deliverance of them. As you read on below uh, the, the 11th verse in that same chapter, um, uh, that they were going to be in captivity and that God was going to deliver them because he had a plan uh, for their lives. At a glance, far from center, Isaiah 29, 13 through 16, let me read these again. It might make better sense. Isaiah 29 through 13. Wherefore, the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of these things, of, of things upside down, shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say, unto, say of him that made it, He made me not. Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. God calls the false prophet rulers and seers to, call, to fall into a deep delusion for choosing. They chose to follow after darkness. As a result, Judah was unable to understand the word of the Lord and brought into a drunken stupor. And that book says the drunken stupor was without alcohol. You know, they couldn't understand anything. Have you ever tried to talk to a drunk man, a drunk, drunk man, and try to explain things to them? They don't understand. They, they can't hear you or they can't focus on what it is that you're trying to tell them because they're drunk. So God put these people into a drunken stupor. Isaiah called them out for their hypocrisy, lip service, and religious performances. The Lord would go on to pronounce spiritual judgment against them through Isaiah saying that their worship of him was misguided. While Judah followed what had become man-made rituals, they failed to reach his heart. Further in their conceit, Judah's leaders thought they could outsmart and hide from God and live without his wisdom. That's terrible. He warned that they would soon be met with sorrow for being so high-minded. The Lord God reminded them that nothing is hidden from him. He is the potter and the one who fashioned and created everything. God is the one that gave them their wisdom. God is the one that gave them everything that they had. God gave them their increase, and they in turn turn around and say, we don't need God. Or they tried to hide things. Or they tried to say, God, don't understand us. We know how to do this on our own. We don't need him. And God's going to bring them back to, to some quick understanding. Um, I want to be careful. <laughs> about, you know, what I say about routine um, in, in worship. Um, but if there was a word, uh, like if I got a gift coming from God, then I'm not apt to take off running uh, because I'm told that I have a gift from God. Uh, instead, um, if I hear that I'm going to get a gift or I have a gift from God, I want to learn how I'm going to obtain that gift. Hey, tell me I got a house on the hill and I run and start shouting and screaming and it, because I'm running and screaming and you told me the address, 
And while I'm running and, and screaming, I didn't hear the address of my new house. So now I don't know how to obtain it. I shout it because I think I got a new house, but now I don't even know how to, how to go and get my house because I was too busy running and hollering and screaming. I'm not saying that anything's wrong with, with, with shouting and praising God, but shout and praise God with, uh, with, with, with an understanding uh, because when we come to church, we fall off into real uh, 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 religious activities uh, because we know how to shout. Uh, we know how uh, to speak in tongues. Oh, you hear sister or brother, whoever over there uh, speaking in tongues, and we can be mockingbirds. We can, we can say the same thing they said, but do you understand that movement of God? Do you understand what the Holy Spirit is? Do you know why? Uh, you're actually speaking in tongues. Do you know? You know, we know when to say amen. You know, we know when to uh, clap our hands. We get in church Sunday after Sunday, and we actually learn those things. It says, but we're not reaching, this book says we're not reaching God's heart when we're not doing it from our heart. He knows our heart, and nothing is hidden from him. He, the Bible says that he is. He is the potter, and we're the clay. So we have to, we have, to, we have to check ourselves. And, you know, and the Bible says that, that those that worship him uh, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, and the scripture says the Lord charges, charges them of hypocrisy in their worship. They outwardly tend to worship and honor God, but not from their hearts. They profess to know God perform all acts of worship, but their hearts are far from him and from keeping his precepts. Because of that, God would judge them. This attitude in worship did not end with the Old Testament times. It continues during the time of Christ Jesus too. Um, it, says in, um, it says in Mark 7, 6 and 7, it says, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. This is, this is God talking to the, to the Pharisees. Jesus talk, talking to the Pharisees. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship in vain. Their, teaching, their teachings are merely uh, human Human rules, okay? We should worship God in spirit and truth and with thanksgiving. You know, we ought to have a thankful heart with what God has done for us and, and know that it was he that, that did those things for us. They think that God does not see. Uh, indeed, the people are not thinking clearly but acting foolishly, thinking that they can hide anything from the Almighty who sees and knows all things. Unfortunately, the hypocritical attitude in worship did not end in the biblical eras. It continues today. Like the people then, we often fall into routine patterns. When we worship, we neglect to give God our full love and devotion. Our worship is constantly becoming routine and uh, ritualistic. We have to be careful with how we praise God. We have to be careful uh, not to just fall into a routine and give God true honor and give God true praise. Uh, number two, return to center. The Lord shifts the message to bring forth hope. For what is to come. God delivers the message through Isaiah. Uh, let me go back. I didn't read uh, verses 17 through 21. Uh, it is not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their Joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to naught, and the scorner is consumed, and all that is that watch for iniquity are cut off, that make a man an offender for a word, and lay a snare for him, and reprove, reprove it in the gate, and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Uh, the Lord shifts the message to bring forth hope for what is to come. God delivers the message through Isaiah that he would turn from judgment to rest restoration of Judah. Which goes back to that top uh, uh, thing in the, in the aim for change. 
that uh, we have to, that, that uh, uh, we will consider how God's promise of mercy will triumph over God's judgment. God has mercy. And he wants, to, he wants to give us mercy and, you know, and try to sway from uh, punishment, which is the reason Jesus Christ came, uh, that God had a plan to come. His mercy allowed him to send Jesus to die on the cross for us. God did a review of his covenant and promised that if the people repented, they would be restored. They would see fruitfulness in the land. The deaf would hear and understand what the Lord says. The blind would see and have the ability to read. Those that would humble themselves for him would be filled with joy, and the poor would rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. In contrast, those who were oppressed, corrupt, evil, and deceivers would be killed and banished from the land. The people would be brought back to their place of dependence and trust in the Lord God, in the Lord God, because their idols would be destroyed. How does God promise of redemption give us hope today? You know, we have a we have a blessed hope in God. You know, He promises to to do the things for us and keep us um, safe from the evil one. Um, he reminds me that there, there are people yet that God is going to use. They could just not be born yet. The Lord has a remnant that can out-preach, out-teach, or out-sing and has a heart for God. What's more, his love doesn't just stop with us. You know, we, we have a tendency to try to put people down because um, uh, they haven't been in church as long as we have. And that person God has a use for um, um, he's going to use people that we, we wouldn't even dream that God would actually use, that give a word, that can preach, teach, and do everything better than what's going on in the church today. We are not the epitome of, of, of God's work. God has people, a remnant, that he can actually use. We think that they're dumb. We think that they uh, uh, don't have because they don't got the suit that you got, the dress that you got, the clothes that you got, the house that you live in. But these people are really uh, in love with God, and they have a heart for the work of God. And these people are going to come forth, uh, and that's according uh, to Scripture. And uh, return to the covenant, verses 22 through 24. Therefore, thus said the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not uh, now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. But when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understand, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. You know, it, 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 the pastor had really started to, 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 to get with us in reference to how we come into the church, how you just come into church and not reverencing God. You know, and not we just got so used to uh, 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 being able to do like we want to do in, in, in church and not fear God. Uh, but there's a people that's going to fear God and do his work um, in a shakedown and, and, and change things from what uh, they are. Um, the return of the covenant, God reinforces his message to the children of Israel by reminding them of their forefathers, Abraham. Although his, his, he chastises the people for their waywardness, he, also, he assures them that they would no longer live in shame and spiritual poverty. God will continue to fulfill his promises to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations and that his seed would be great in the land. God's chosen people would return to, if God's chosen people would return to a position of worship and awe of God, then the, spirit plug, then the spiritual plug would be removed to comprehend and follow God's commands. God's people need only to remember to look for how God has remained faithful to the promises he made to Abraham all those hundreds of years ago with those blessings of wealth and pro prog progeny fulfilled, even though who scoffed at God and ignored his instructions would change their ways. You know, God uh, did promise um, Abraham that, that, that he would be a father of many nations, and we have been grafted in uh, to that promise. So God's plan of salvation is for us, no matter how many times it takes. Um, yes, we do mess up, but God's grace is ever-present. Uh, the Bible says that his mercy is new every morning. 
Uh, and, and a lot of times we just have to learn to forgive ourselves. And, you know, the scripture says that he has a plan for our lives. And we have to trust uh, that he actually has that plan for us. Our liberating lesson, God loves, God's love is balanced and he freely lavishes his grace on those who would receive it, if you would receive it. God's kindness is intended to lead to, to repentance. However, he will allow circumstances and experiences to chastise and bring us to place of surrender. After chastisement, God lovingly restores what would happen if our current system of justice followed God's model. The intent of criminal justice system should not only be to punish for offenses, but to effect to affect it should uh, also be restorative. Offenders should have access to programs within the system that rehabilitates, bringing mental, emotional, and spiritual healing that gets to the root causes of deviant behavior. Um, and with that, you know, God has a plan to where we can come back and be restored to Him. He has that plan to where uh, He doesn't hold us to uh, the, 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 the wrong that we've done. That it's not our righteousness that we stand in, but we stand in the righteousness of God. So application for activation. When you consider God's redemptive work through Jesus Christ, how can you focus your attention on making disciples? How can you mentor and support individuals or group their development? Is there a person or, pop or population you feel called to serve? What hope from your testimony? Testimony is an indicator of what you can offer to bring healing to another soul. And with the Bible study we had the other night, uh, you know, God allows us to tell our story. I can't tell your story. I can tell my story uh, about how God saved me, how God brought me out of the streets, how God put me where I am today. And I owe God that. And every time I think about it, I have to give God praise. I have to give him honor because I couldn't do it myself. I was stuck uh, in a place. So be blessed. I hope you were blessed. Uh, and God bless. Uh, good morning. Amen.